Oh, unmute, unmute. Unmute, Hal. There you go. We'd like to welcome you to Growing Hostas tonight. And Remy Link, um, she works at Cornell Cooperative Extension as our Ag Economic Administrative Assistant. And she's also our maple educator. And her and her husband own Maple Link Farm. And she's our hosta expert. And welcome, Remy. And we will be taking questions and answers in the question and answer box and answering them at the end of the presentation. And this presentation is recorded. Well, great, Holly, thank you. Um, let me share my screen and we'll uh, begin. And hopefully everyone can see this. And um, yes, welcome to um, my Hosta Gardens. Um, my name is Remy Link, as Holly said. I work with her at our Cornell Cooperative Extension Office in Oneida County. And I am a Hosta lover. I do appreciate Hostas. I enjoy Hostas. Um, I think every garden really could use a Hosta. <laughs> Um, and I'm just going to um, show you, this is actually a, a picture of my garden um, with my dinosaur and uh, just a, a few of my hostas. In this presentation, um, I am, um, most of my hostas are labeled so you will know what, what they are. Um, we're gonna go over a few of the different topics uh, that we'll be covering tonight. Um, we're gonna go over some of the growing locations, just a basic um, general, uh, knowledge of hostas, some of the key definitions, uh, sporting and reverting, uh, which are two things that um, can happen to hostas, uh, how to divide the division, um, light requirements, large, um, they come in a large varieties of shapes and sizes from mini to giant. Uh, we're, we'll talk a little bit about some planting and composition with hostas, a disease, and we'll wrap up with um, the garden pest, the dreaded garden pest. Um, and in this presentation, I will say, I do have a, a few of my favorite hostas. Actually, this is one of my uh, favorite hostas. This is Lakeside Paisley Print. Um, it's a gorgeous hosta. It has green in it, it has blue in it, uh, a little bit of the chartreuse. Um, as it um, goes on in the summer, um, that'll start turning a little bit white. Um, it'll, it'll remove the chartreuse and start turning white. It's a very little, cute little hosta. A um, couple of facts about hostas. They are native to China and Korea and Japan. Um, they do like about 50 to 60 inches of rain each year. Um, they do need a, a period of dormancy. And um, you can really grow them in a container, um, in a hanging basket or in the ground. They're very versatile um, and, and they can be very forgiving. Our climate here in the Northeast, um, you know, we have a similar rainfall. Our temperatures are um, in a good growing degree, about that 75 to 90 uh, degrees. Um, these are all the ideal conditions that hosta likes so we are in, in the Northeast, actually in a perfect conditions for hostas. Um, some of our definitions, uh, there is such a thing called a hostaholic, which is an over-enthusiastic hosta collector, hybridizer, or hosta competitor. And um, these are photographs of my mother's blue ribbons. Uh, she's a member of the Georgia Hosta Society um, she tends to be, as you can see, um, very competitive. <laughs> she competes uh, ev every year. She competes. Um, a lot of times she'll um, pick up uh, the sweepstakes award. Um, she's won five of them so far, which is an award for the most blue ribbons at one show. Um, so she is an extraordinary uh, competitor. Um, I, I do not quite do that, but she does. And I'd like to recognize her also. Um, most of these pictures are from my gardens. 
um, but some of them are actually from her garden. So it's, um, you'll see some southern hostas and some northern hostas. Now, when we're talking here also, I'll, I'll be mentioning things like a crown. Um, and that is, as you see the, the picture on the top right, uh, it's right where the shoots and the roots meet. Um, and the shoots are referred to as eyes. And those are um, a, a dormant bud. And right now, this time of year, depending on where you are, um, in the area, most um, it, most places right now, you're you're seeing your shoots coming up. You may see some of the leaves starting to unfurl, but the hostas are just starting to wake up for the season. Um, when I refer to, to margin, um, which is the hosta the night before Christmas, I would say that has a green margin. Those are the outer section of the leaf. Um, when, it, when I'm speaking about patterns, um, Gypsy Rose, um, that actually has a streaked pattern. It's a little hard to see in the, the picture, but um, there is a white streak that runs in that leaf. And there's also Hosta Spilt Milk. And if you look closely on those leaves, it's, it's a very um, molted, speckled leaf. Um, looks almost like someone did actually spilt milk on the leaf. Um, it's very, an unusual leaf. Uh, that's actually one of the hostas for the kind of source. Um, so if you can get your hands on a spilt milk, um, you can consider yourself a, a, a good collector. <laughs> um, petiole, when we refer to petioles, uh, you can look at the photograph of the hosta first blush. That has a red petiole. Um, and that is actually something that has been in the last five, 10 years, a lot of the hybridizers have been um, trying to grow more hostas with red stems or purple stems. And they're trying to get that color up into the leaf. Um, and, and they're doing a pretty good job of it. Um, when we refer to escape, escape is where the flowers, the flower stem is. Um, Red petiole hostas, um, something, as I mentioned, I, I'd like to focus a little bit on. Um, Red October on the bottom left, uh, that is actually one of the older varieties. Um, that one has been around for quite some time um, that you can see it has just a lovely red stem. Um, and it actually, it's, it's a green leaf on the top and the underside is actually uh, white. Uh, it's got a, a white waxy coating on the uh, underside. It's quite a lovely hosta. It's a good beginner hosta. Uh, Sun Worshipper on the top right uh, also is, is a very nice hosta uh, with a red stem. And Island Breeze. Island Breeze, I believe, uh, was one of the hostas of the year uh, recently. Um, and that's a very nice hosta. That's one of the newer hostas that, have, that has come out. And it is also um, a nice upright hosta. As you can see, it, it stands up in the pot. Sporting hostas. Um, this happens sometimes. Sometimes hostas will uh, sport because of um, not being divided or moved in a while. And, um, and sometimes they'll just do it um, naturally. It doesn't happen all the time, but you know, you should always, when you're looking at your hostas, um, you, you want to be aware of sporting. Um, and, and sporting basically is a creation of, of a new type of hosta. And sometimes you might get a leaf variegation um, one year. If it happens the second year and it's getting bigger, um, then you're definitely getting a sport. And what you can do with that is, um, if you do notice something like that, you can actually dig up your hosta and pull it out and um, separate just that eye and the crown uh, from the main part of the plant. You wanna pull it out of the plant and then you can plant it somewhere else and um, you know, you'll, you'll have a new hosta. This is something, um, this was my first frost, which um, is a sport off of uh, the parent plant is Halcyon, 
which is a solid blue leaf. Um, the first frost should just be a, um, just have that chartreuse margin. And it, you can see when you look in this picture, um, I'm getting these solid yellow leaves. Um, and in even some of the margins, you can see how the margin is much wider. Um, if you can see my mouse moving uh, on this one. Um, so that's, there's an eye in there that is sporting and, and changing. Um, and this is another hosta um, that we're just starting to watch. I'm starting to get a little bit of a different pattern on the leaf and, and I'll keep an eye on that one. Now reverting is a little different than sporting. And um, what you basically need to know is, um, the important thing is, is when you have your hostas, what the parent plants are. Um, the photograph on the left is a gold standard hosta reverting to the uh, Fortuni. And um, the gold standard is the uh, large juice center with uh, the green on the edge. But when you look at the top of the hosta, you can see the, the solid darker gray green leaves. That's the parent plant. So what's happening with that one in this particular one, this, this one is one of mine. This one uh, hasn't been divided in a very, very long time. Um, I, I put that clump in, it's probably about a 10 year old clump. And um, you know, it's starting to revert back. The photograph on the right hand side actually came out from our gardens over at Cooperative Extension. And uh, it's, a, it's supposed to be a strip tease, uh, which is, um, has the little white variegation on the leaf and it's reverting to the parent plant and it's also um, sporting back to the gold standard. Uh, you can see right uh, with the purple arrow right on the bottom uh, with the chartreuse leaf, it looks just like the gold standard on the left hand side. So um, that was something that was very unusual. That happened um, last year and it was, it was very, very unusual to happen. Uh, division. Division is that's the best way to um, divide your hostas is, is division. And if you want to reproduce um, your hosta, you can get hostas, um, you can have tissue cultures. Uh, when, you, when the growers do a tissue cu culture of a hosta, they tend to grow very slowly. Um, so that's something um, that you want to look out for if you're buying um, hostas. Uh, I tend to try to avoid tissue cultures. So um, I, I would prefer to have something divided off of um, an original stock or um, you know, if you're dividing something from one of your friends or your neighbors and they're very easy to divide. You, know, you, you dig it up, you can see the roots are very fibrous um, and, and you, you really don't have to be very gentle with them. You can you know, take a shovel, take a knife you can cut it right down the center and, and pull them apart and they divide very easily. And um, if you do it in the springtime, um, as you see here in the, these pictures, um, this will minimize any shock to the plant um, because the leaves really haven't unfurled. And if you do it in the spring, you'll, you'll tend to get a more rounder form of a plant. They'll look much better than if uh, you, you try to divide it midsummer while, while all the leaves have come out. Some things, um, when you do do some divisions, uh, most hostas um, will revert to what they call as a juvenile. Um, and even though you may take, uh, you may have a very mature hosta and you, um, you know, the leaves are very mature and you pull the piece off, you, mil you will get a juvenile and it may look very, very different from the parent plant. And this is an example of guardian angel. And on the left is the juvenile version of guardian angel. And you can see that when you look at the leaves, they're very pointy um, they're, and they're very small compared to the parent plant on the right-hand side. Um, guardian angel is one of the more slow growers. Uh, that clump is probably about eight years old or so. Um, 
and it's taken quite a while um, for it to, to get that size, but you can see how the difference in the leaf is. It, it's much more round. Um, the variegation on the, the leaf is, it, it takes up most of the leaf. Um, so that's something to, to be aware of. Sometimes when you'll split that hosta and it'll come up the following year and you'll say, oh, that wasn't what I thought it was. Well, just you just got to give it a chance to actually mature. And usually maturity happens um, within about three to five years on most hostas where they actually start to look um, to their, they, they're at their mature size and they start to look like uh, what they're supposed to look like. Light requirements. Um, all hostas need some sun exposure and dappled sunlight um, is the best for them. Um, they like four to six hours of sun. Uh, there are some hostas that can take more sun, um, but you, what you, something to keep in mind is the more sun you give your hosta, the more water um, you have to give your hosta. Uh, hostas do not like wet feet. Uh, they don't want to be in, in water all the time, but they do like a lot of water, and especially the larger hostas. When you start getting into the large and the giant hostas, they do like uh, a lot more uh, water. Um, this is actually a, a picture of one of some of my mother's hostas. <laughs> uh, the sun-tolerant hostas, as, as I said, you, there are some hostas that you can put out uh, in a little bit more sun. Sun tolerant doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, sun all day long. Um, this is, these all three photographs are um, hosta sage. Uh, and that's actually another one of my favorites. It's a nice hosta. This is a giant hosta. Uh, has a very large leaf. The um, bottom uh, left picture is sage actually in, a, in more of a, a, a sun setting that's in a east setting. Uh, no shade from, from the trees or anything, but it does get shade from the house. And um, the bottom right is sage in shade under a tree. And if you look at the leaves on there, um, the right hand picture, the leaf is more blue uh, where the left one, where the poppies are, uh, it's more green. And that's something that will happen when you do put those out in, in the sun. Uh, those hostas will tend to uh, look more green. If there's any wax coating on the hostas, they, they tend to want to melt off because they are getting uh, more sun exposure. And um, a, a juvenile example is the top left. Um, you can see how different uh, that little plant of the hosta of sage looks so much uh, different from the bottom photograph. Um, some of the hostas, I'll go through um, hosta sizes. Hostas, like I said a little bit earlier, uh, they're miniature uh, to giant, uh, all different sizes. Um, and basically when the hosta society did, um, decides what size classification they're going to go into. Um, it's on the leaf size. So leaves that are under six inch square um, would be all considered miniature hostas. Um, and I had a presentation a while ago where someone asked, oh, you know, it'd be nice if I had a, uh, a reference point. Um, so you can see how small some of these leaves are. And if you look on the, the bottom uh, right picture, the hosta cherish. Uh, you can see the tag, um, the hosta tag, and you know we all are familiar with the little plant tags that come with the plants. That hopefully can give you an idea of how small that leaf is. It's about the size of a quarter. Uh, that's a very tiny leaf. Um, if uh, you want to grow miniature hostas, blue mouse ears, the, the center hosta, is a uh, good beginner hosta. It's one of the more hardier hostas, um, easy to grow for beginners um, because some, some of the smaller ones uh, tend to be a little finicky. <laughs> Small hostas are um, hostas with leaves six to 25 inches. Um, these are all good examples of small hostas. 
Um, the bottom left, curly fries, that is another one of my uh, favorite hostas uh, that has a, a lance-shaped leaf, um, a pointed leaf with a wavy edge. Um, it's a very attractive hosta. Uh, June, uh, bottom right, the hosta June, uh, that is also another one of my favorites. That was also a, a hosta of the year. Um, that's a, a wonderful hosta for a beginner hosta. Easy to grow, very hardy. It will grow in um, your dappled sunlight, and you can also put it out in um, more sun. If it's grown in dappled sunlight, it tends to look a little bit more blue. And if you give it a little bit more sun, uh, you'll get the greens will come out more. Medium hostas. Um, these are medium uh, hostas. They're the 25 to 81 square inches for the leaf. Uh, first frost, um, which was the one that I talked about earlier, um, that was um, sporting um, the top um, right picture. That's actually what first frost should look like with, without a, a sport in it. Um, the uh, bottom center, hosta wolverine. Uh, that is actually uh, another one of my favorite hostas. That particular one, uh, that's a quick grower actually. Um, that's at a mature size. That probably only took about three years to, to get to that point. Um, that is, that's a good hasa. Um, and actually, uh, twilight time is, is another good hasa for um, beginner hostas. Large hostas. Um, you need to have some space for large hostas. Um, 81 to 144 square inches on the leaves. Um, the leaves are um, quite large, um, and, and typically the plants are going to be large too. Most of the plants, um, large hostas, are generally 24 to 36 um, tall, um, and their spreads are usually around five to six feet. Um, some of the smaller ones might be uh, four feet wide, but uh, large hostas do tend to uh, need a lot of room. Um, they also like a lot of water. Uh, giant hostas, um, they're uh, <laughs> even more fun. Um, Elegans, uh, for a giant hosta, that is, that's an easy hosta. That hosta has, um, that's a parent hosta, Elegans, has a lot of sports. Uh, Francis Williams, which is um, uh, actually the hosta that's just behind the hosta elegans in the picture, um, right at the, at the top of the frame, that's Francis Williams, that's a, a sport uh, of elegans. Uh, Great Expectations, uh, um, Dreamweaver, th there's a lot of different um, good sports that came off of this one. Um, the hosta um, which is a juvenile Empress Wu, the photograph where you can see my hand. Um, and that's, as I said, a juvenile. That plant was only about, um, I was, I think, the second year on that. And you can see how large um, that leaf is. That particular hosta, um, that's one of the largest ones around. That's a, a, like 48 inches tall. 60 to 72 inches wide. Um, so it's going to be quite substantial. It needs a lot of room. Um, so you make sure you give a hosta like that a lot of space um, and it should have a, a lot of water available to it. Uh, Regal Splendor actually is uh, a nice upright hosta as well as uh, Brutus, um, which is on the bottom right. That's also a, a lovely hosta. And um, you know, they don't, hostas don't always have to be in the ground. You can see in the photograph of Brutus, that's uh, actually in my mother's garden. And um, she's got that growing in a pot. So even though they are giant hostas, you can put them in a large enough pot and they will be successful. Composition for containers. Um, you can, you can plant a hosta, a single hosta in a container, um, that's fine. Um, you can also plant them uh, with other hostas, with house plants. Uh, sometimes I'll plant them, uh, I'll tuck annuals in around them. Um, if it's a, a garden uh, container that I want to 
bring out every year. I'll, I'll put some perennials in there, like maybe columbine. Um, that's a nice one that you can put in there. Uh, this particular photograph is um, a mouse display, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, hostas have a, a ton of names. And uh, this particular one, uh, there's church mouse, sun mouse, and mini skirt mouse. Uh, this is a container garden my mother has done. And um, she put it in a tub. So, you know, you want to be creative. You can be creative with your containers. You can put them almost anywhere. Um, you can have, like I said, big hostas, small hostas, um, but you just want to be aware of what the mature size is and fit the container appropriately to the size of your hosta. Garden composition, um, and I can't, like I said, I can't stress this enough, really. You have to pay attention to the mature size of your hosta. Um, you know, want to know what the habit is. Is it an upright hosta? Is it a mounding hosta? Um, does it uh, undulate and just fold right over? Um, you want to complement your colors. You can repeat colors and um, you can use them. Hostas can be used as, you know, like a ground cover or just a single specimen in a garden. And in this example, um, this is my, one of my gardens, one of my bigger gardens. Um, the hostas in there are at various ages, so you can see in that photograph there's some spaces uh, between there, um, some of them, and that reason is why is because some of the hostas are newly planted and they are going to be getting larger, but I'm trying to use um, the hostas as, as a ground cover to, to cover the whole bed, and eventually they'll all they'll fill in. When you're um, planting in, in the yard, um, really, you know, the ideal, again, is the springtime to, to plant hostas. Um, you'll do the least amount of damage to the plant in the spring, but you can plant them any time of year. You want to set them in firmly, just like any, anything else, um, and you only want to set them in um, at the level of the crown. You really don't want to bury the crown uh, too far into the ground um, because then your hostas will be, sh be short. They'll kind of stunt them a little bit so that you want the crown right underneath the dirt level. Um, you want to set them in firmly. You want to water them in wells so the dirt can uh, wash around the roots. Um, and you don't want to over, you want to put them in firmly, but you don't want to over compact the soil, especially for the mini hostas. Uh, that's not something that you want to do. Mini hostas, you can actually kind of suffocate the roots. So you want to try to avoid that. Uh, mulching around the hostas, um, I, I like to do that. Um, not necessarily mulch on the eyes, but you want to put your mulch around the plant. Um, and that'll help keep the water, help keep it moist, especially if it's a dry summer. Um, and, and have a plan um, when, when you're doing that. And as you can see, sometimes this is a, a newer, one of my newer gardens. Um, I'll take a photograph and I'll label them um, so I know what they are, um, especially sometimes uh, tags can get misplaced and then you wonder, oh, you know, what hosta was that? And if you're not uh, quite up to the speed, you might forget your name of your hosta. So if you take a photograph and just take a moment of time and label everything, this is like a reference point that you can go back and um, you know what you have and you know, then you can also see year to year. If you keep taking pictures every year, you can see how things progress. You can see if you like something. If you don't, you can make changes. Um, maximizing size. Um, when I was saying putting them in groups, um, the photograph on the left, um, I'm grouping a set of hostas in the back as a border. Um, to accent um, the hostas that are forward, uh, which is, uh, that's a Valentine's Lace and uh, First Frost, and there's a little blue mouse here on the bottom. Um, the photograph on the right-hand side actually is a grouping of Halcyon, and um, those are actually three groups of Halcyon, um, just to make a big cluster so you can get a really big impact. Um, so there's different ways of um, grouping the hostas um, so you can maximize that, that effect. 
You can use a variety of uh, companion plants to add interest. Um, I generally like to add something in there, whether it's a little pachysandra. Um, you have to be careful with pachysandra because it will drown out um, smaller hosta. So if you are going to put that in there, it really should be in with a, a large or a giant hosta. Um, but columbine, um, hardy geraniums, those types of things are, are nice to mix in. Primrose, I like to do that because that's a nice spring uh, flower. Um, you can do large clumps um, and then, you know, put other perennials around there. Some of the, the common ones that I use, Estelby, that, that are really, they work very well um, because they're um, compatible, their light requirements are compatible. Uh, Estelby, Columbine, um, Hardy Geraniums, is, that's another one of my, my favorites. And like I said, the Primrose. Um, a heuchera. Heuchera is a very nice companion plant uh, also to use, um, you know, because you can get those contrasting colors and the contrasting leaf shapes with hostas. Some of the diseases. Um, you can have uh, rot on, on your hosta if you over mulch or over water, or if it happens to be um, maybe uh, like at, at the drip edge on a, um, the house line um, and all the water just kind of dumps uh, on it. They like water, as I said earlier, but they do not like wet feet. So um, you can get some rot disease, fungals um, in the soils. Uh, you wanna try to avoid that. If you start seeing something um, that looks like this where it's rotting, uh, you can either remove the plant uh, dig it up, uh, clean it out, remove all the dead debris. If you want to try to save it, what I would recommend is um, isolate it, put it in a pot and isolate it somewhere else because you don't want to be transplanting anything. But, you know, you should hopefully wash the soil off very well and pull down any of the decayed um, branches um, and stems that are on there. Um, and that's one of the ways that you can get that to go. Um, the only really, the, the major disease that the hosta has, um, it's virus X. There's not a lot known about it. It's something that happens. Um, typically, you, you'll pick it up generally at some of the larger um, commercial growers, you know, sometimes the box stores because they're growing these hostas um, in large mass numbers. And if um, there is some disease in there, those will typically spread. So these are examples of um, some virus X. Um, and you can see it's not sporting. Um, it's the leaves just, like the pigments in the leaves just change. And um, if you see that the best thing to do, and, and sometimes it's very hard to do, but you need to dig it up, you need to put it in a bag, tie the bag up, and you need to put it in the garbage. Um, you do not wanna try to save it, re to bring it back to life, change it. Um, you just wanna get it away from your other hostas because you don't want it to spread. So um, like I said, dig it up. And then once after you do dig it up and you dispose of it, clean your garden tools. Um, you're gonna to wanna to do that is clean the garden tools. Voles. Um, voles are a pretty good enemy of hostas. Um, it, a, a vole is not a mole. Uh, a vole is something that uh, tends to stay on the surface and will uh, burrow and basically eat your plant uh, up and you'll never even notice. And it usually happens in the winter time when the snow is uh, covering everything and uh, it can become a disappointment in the spring. Um, but if you do have vole damage, and, and you'll notice um, your ground, uh, you'll see little trails in the ground. The ground will be very soft um, because the voles are uh, just burrowing just, just at the top surface of the ground. Um, but you can plant your hostas in containers. Um, you want to keep your lawn mowed um, and brush and debris. You don't want to over mulch. Um, if you have, you know, cats are great for voles. Um, 
snakes if you you know no one likes to have a lot of snakes in their garden but you know they'll they'll also um, take care of moles sometimes and there are some home remedies um, that are successful with moles and um, you know you can always group hostas in containers if you have a really bad mole problem and unfortunately hostas hostas and daylilies um, are two plants that have very tuberous, um, full roots. Uh, those are things that voles, those are two things that voles really go after if, if you do have a vole problem. And um, this is some of the containers in my mother's garden. Um, and she's got them in the, in the pots, um, so she doesn't have to worry about voles. But you can always put them in pots um, to try to avoid that too. If you don't want to put them in pots and um, you do, you know, you have noticed some bowl problems in, you, in your yard, um, you can do this. I, I have done this. Um, I don't usually have voles all the time, but occasionally um, I'll, I'll get some voles. And if I do, um, I, you want to get some castor oil. You want to make sure it's the scented. Don't buy the unscented castor oil. Um, and a gallon of water and a tablespoon of dish detergent. And you can put it in a, a jug, a plastic milk jug, and uh, just water uh, your hostas. And um, generally what I will do is, once everything has died down uh, in the fall, and I'll clean up uh, any of the leaves. Um, that's the time I'll, I'll trim and clean anything up. Um, just water, just like you're watering your hostas, you wanna um, take this uh, mixture and just water your hosta, and that'll protect it all winter long. Um, and you shouldn't have any bowl problems. The other uh, predator for hostas, let's call them deer. Um, I have been battling deer for quite a few years. I haven't had a problem, but the last few years um, really have had a problem uh, with them. And you know, there's a, there's a number of things that you can do. You can try the commercial deer, deer repellents like liquid fence, deer off, uh, those types of things. Uh, if they're small hostas, um, I use barbecue skewers, the, the 12 inch long barbecue skewers. I will um, put them around the hosta with the points up. So when the deer bend down and they try to take a bite out of the leaf, um, they'll get poked in the nose. Um, that only works on the small ones. You, of course, the large ones, you'd have to get bigger skewers. Um, you can always fence in your hostas or, or fence in your backyard. Um, if you have a dog or there's predators in your area, that'll also keep the deer um, out. And, and you know, you want to make your area as unattractive as possible. You want to get rid of hiding spots and tall brush and, and things like that. Um, those are ways to repel the deer. Um, as I said, I, I have been battling uh, deer and, you know, no one really likes to go out in their garden and, and see this. You know, you start with a beautiful hosta, everything looks great, and then you get up one morning and you go out and you look at your garden and you see big bites out of the leaves, <laughs> which is very depressing. If you do start to see things like this, address it. You should try to address it immediately because what's going to happen is they're going to come back the next night. And if they didn't finish the hosta off the first night, they're going to finish it off the next night. Um, so you really want to try to get on top of that. Um, this is a before and after. <laughs> this is another one of, this is one of my gardens, uh, a larger one. So this one's a little harder. Um, to protect, but um, that was over the course of, this was last year, probably the most hosta damage I've ever seen. I've never had this much hosta damage. Um, and it happened just over the course of a few nights. Um, there must have been multiple, multiple deers in there and they ate everything down, all the way down to the stem. Um, there wasn't a, a lot left. <laughs> Um, and, you know, they even came right up to the house, um, as you can see in this picture. Um, they went and ate all along the house. Um, 
I don't know why they left this uh, June in the bottom left hand corner alone. Um, it does have a harder leaf, but it ate um, June in, in that big garden. I had that in the big garden too, so I, I'm not quite sure why they left one um, here. And actually, um, that picture also is an example. Um, you can see the solid blue leaves. The halcyon is um, reverting. The June is reverting back to halcyon on that one. That one um, I actually just did the other day. I, as the eyes came up and I identified um, the blue ones versus uh, the ones that were variegated, I, I actually pulled the blue eyes out. So hopefully this year I have no blue eyes in there. But um, if you do, if you do see this um, where they ate all your leaves off and they, they left the stalks on. Um, don't cut your hostas down, you know, especially if it's early, if it's still in the summer or early fall, um, because whatever green is on there, um, your photosynthesis is going to work and, you know, your plant's going to get a little bit of energy, not a lot, but it's still going to get a little bit of energy. I know they, it looks a little ugly, but try not to cut them um, back because that hosta has gone into a big shock. Um, and so most likely um, the following year, they're not gonna be as big as, as they have been in previous years. Uh, last, one of the last resorts and your, your best, one of the best tool um, is fencing. Um, fencing should be tall enough. Um, if it's not tall enough, you still can use about a four or five foot fence. Um, as long as it's narrow, um, because if you if you have a narrow bed, they tend they they, they don't want to jump into a narrow bed. They deer have a depth perception issue, so if you can um, you can do a short fence in a narrow um, bed. But if if it, if you're trying to protect your whole backyard, a short fence is not going to work. They're, they're most certainly going to jump over it. You need more of an eight foot fence. Um, you know if you're trying to do your entire backyard. But um, this is one of the things I did because um, I love my hostas and I want to protect them. And unfortunately, you know, I've got a lot of deer right now. So we're, we're trying to teach them to go elsewhere. So um, we put up some uh, fencing and um, they haven't gone in there. <laughs> a couple of things um, I want to kind of uh, wrap up with is to give you some information on where to um, pick up hostas. Um, you can always pick them up at your local nurseries, um, local growers. That's great. If you are um, looking for more unusual hostas, um, hard to find hostas, um, there are many online um, places, growers, hybridizers that you can um, purchase from. My favorite and where most of my hostas have come from is New Hampshire hosta. Um, I highly recommend them. They're very good. They are grown in New Hampshire, so they're northern grown. So if you're trying to put them in a northern garden, um, they're perfectly adequate. There are hostas um, that are grown for the south um, that uh, some of the ones that my mother has, um, they don't do as well for me uh, up here because they, they want something a little hotter. So if you're up in the Northeast, you want to try to make sure that you find um, a, a grower that is in, uh, in a colder climate in the North. Um, in the Country Garden is another one there in Iowa um, that I've gotten some plants uh, from, very happy with. Um, there's also the land of the giant hosta farm uh, there in Wisconsin. And of course, there's the white flower farm in Connecticut. Uh, some printed resources. Um, if you have more interest and you want to start reading up on hostas, um, I would recommend grabbing uh, a current edition of the uh, uh, Hosta Encyclopedia that will get you a ton of knowledge. Um, you'll learn about what the parents are, what the sports of the parents are, all different types of things, a uh, lot more detail. Um, there's books on just the, the minis um, because they have a life of it their own and they need special care. Um, but you know, these are just a, a handful of uh, resources. There's a lot of resources out there on hostas. 
uh, you can contact the American Hospice Society. Uh, we also have the Upstate New York Hospice Society. You can call Cooperative Extension here in Oneida County. I can try to help you or um, find out what, what kind of question if you have a question. And um, if you want to just do your own research or have some questions uh, online, there's um, a website called the Hosta Library. And um, you can put a Hosta name in and it'll give you all the information uh, on, on that particular Hosta. So um, we'll start to, we'll wrap these up. Um, well, if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Um, and they, they can put them right into the question and answer. Thank you, Remy. And yes. I'm going to pull up the poll questions real quick. And if I'm going to launch it now, there's three questions if you could answer them. Oh, sure. Okay, and we'll share the results now with everybody. Looks like everybody's voted. Have you grown hostas before? 75% said yes, 25% said no. Will you incorporate what you learned from tonight's class into your gardening practice of growing hostas? 100% said yes. And three, will you share with others what you learned from this class session? And 88% said yes. And thank you for answering those. And this will be also be posted to YouTube on Cornell Cooperative Extension site. Now we will move to the questions. And we did have one in chat here first. Um, someone mentioned that they have great luck with liquid fence, but yes. they had to reply after rain, but if it works wonders for her. Yes, that's that's the only, um, my, what I find successful with repelling deer is to try to use a combination of things. Um, I, I've used mothballs before, I've um, used the liquid fence is very effective, but you know, you do have the point when it rains, you do have to reapply. And uh, you know, sometimes I swear they know when it rains because they go right after them as soon as <laughs> it rains and the scent is gone. Um, but you know, mothballs are also, not everybody likes the smell of mothballs, but that um, you can hang them in little bags around. That also will help um, put that scent in the, in the air. Um, but like I said, I use all sorts of things. I use fencing, I use the bamboo, bamboo skewers. I use, um, right now actually, I'm trying out, uh, it's called the, the Yard Sentinel and it's an ultrasonic um, sound uh, machine that you plug in. Um, it, you plug in or it, it can work on battery also. And um, I'll let you know how that works because I just started it. Um, I've got a camera set on it and um, it's facing my hosta garden so I can watch and see what the deer, if they actually go in my garden or not. So we'll have to report back to you on that. I have to say, Remy, I, what I love about and what's real about these garden talks is we share the good, the bad and the ugly. And you did, you shared it and it's, it's a reality. We're, we're not a fancy garden show here. We're, we're telling you that this can happen and this is, some ways that maybe you can deal with it. So I really appreciated your honesty there and the pictures were awesome. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, there's a question here, will hostas do okay in a sunny location? Um, yes, um, some hostas are sun tolerant. So, you, you know, if you have a sunny location, 
um, or, or, or I should say sunnier location. It doesn't really, they don't do best in total full sun. Very, very few do. Um, but you can buy hostas that are sun tolerant. So when you're going in, um, on, like on the websites like New Hampshire Hosta, or if you look up on the Hosta library, you can find su specifically sun tolerant hostas. So if you have a sunnier location, um, find those hostas and um, you can use that. Like Summon Substance is a hosta that's sun tolerant. Um, the Sage is a, a sun tolerant. There's one called Sun Power. There's a, there are a number of hostas um, that are sun tolerant. Okay, um, thank you, Remy. Next yep. question. I have heard that there are between 3,000 and 8,000 varieties of hosta. Do you know what the number is? I don't know what it is, but I would say it's probably closer to about 10,000. Wow. <laughs> I didn't know there that. are they are constantly there are a lot of hybridizers a lot of growers um, and, and they are constantly coming up with things um, and some of them are very you know sometimes there's subtle very subtle differences like the hasta that's behind me um, thunderbolt it it those are elegans um, the parent plant is elegans and depending on the size of the margin and the leaf variegation they may look very similar. Um, Great Expectations has um, looks very similar, but the the white in the center is is much larger. Um, so the margin is it's a smaller margin than what you see here. So um, there's thousands of of hostas. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Next question. I have a berm with evergreens, and the evergreens have it have created a shady, shaded area. Will hostas do well so close to the evergreens? Yeah, they, they're fine. I mean, they, they will grow with evergreens. Um, you know, they'll grow pretty much anywhere. Um, maple trees, Norway maples, um, tend, and, and cherry trees. Um, you wanna try to avoid those areas. The only reason why is um, because their roots can be very competitive with the hostas. The hostas will still grow there, but they might not do as well as they could. Um, so evergreens are okay. Oak trees are okay. Uh, a Japanese maple um, always looks very nice with a hosta. Um, that's fine too. Okay, thank you. And here's another question. Should I clear dead hosta leaves in the fall or wait to clean them up in the spring? I like to do them in the fall. And the reason why is if, if you have any kinds of voles, um, you, you wanna get them off. Um, you wanna clean that area up. You don't wanna have a place where the vole is gonna have some protection and, and just wanna hang out on top of the crown and eat it all winter long. Um, so I, I try to do that. Plus it helps with any disease, if, you know, any rot that you may get. So, you know, if you can clean them up in, in the fall and it makes it easier because when the spring, comes, they start popping up and they're all ready to go. <laughs> okay, thank you. And he, he, here's another question. And she said, wonderful presentation. I can't wait to pot grow one this season. What size of pot is the best size? It, it depends on the size of the hosta. Um, I, I have them in little six inch pots and I have the minis in there, like blue mouse ears. Um, you know, Cherish can even go into a, a smaller pot than that. Um, if you've got, um, you know, a larger hosta, you put it in, in a larger pot. So, um, and you, you also have to remember too, you can always repot them. Um, if you put your hosta in a pot um, and you want to um, do something with it in the wintertime, one thing that I, I will mention is what I do all my hostas that I have in pots, they're in plastic pots in, inside a decorative pot. And I'll pull them out in the fall and I plant them, I dig a hole and I plant them in my vegetable garden to, to winter over. Oh, um, so that you answered my question was, what do you do in the winter? With what do you do with it? Hostas, you have to, they have to go That's through dormancy. You can't put them in your, in a garage or a cold basement and just every once in a while, just give it a little bit of water okay. um, so they don't totally dry out. And then as soon as the weather starts to warm up, you can take them back outside and they'll start to sprout. 
So when you put it in the vegetable garden, you don't mulch it or anything. You just let it sit down in the ground where it's going to keep some warmth because of the deepness of the. Yeah, I, I put it at the level, just yeah. like it, just like it was planted yeah. normally. Okay. Oh, um, wonderful! I love that. Sometimes idea. I mulch. I don't mulch them on purpose, but sometimes in the vegetable garden, I'll chop up my leaves and throw them on there. So sometimes they get mulch, sometimes they don't. But you just put it, um, put the the level of the dirt at the level of the garden dirt. You know, what I found fascinating, I just have to say this last thing is, as I looked at your gardens as a gardener, you had color and texture and all those key ingredients in your gardens. And a lot of it was just hostas. They were beautiful. Ho hostas are, are beautiful. You know, people that do flower arrangements and things, you have to remember those hosta leaves are wonderful fillers. You can do an arrangement of just hosta leaves, different kinds of hosta leaves. I do that in, in the office in the summertime. I'll bring in I leaves and I'll put up. them in a vase. I never knew you could do that till Remy brought them in the office. I'm <laughs> like, are, and how long do you think they lasted when you put them in? Oh, water? they last a super long time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so guys, if you're growing hostas, bring them in the house, enjoy them. <laughs> cut, a, cut a few leaves off, put them in a vase, bring them in the house, you know, throw a carnation or a rose or something in there with it. Awesome. Um, yeah, because they'll, they'll last in, in the house, you know, they'll last like two or three weeks. Yeah. Fascinating. This, well, I've, I've learned a lot from you, you know, just working with you, but this was really amazing, Remy. Thank well, you. Thank so you. Much. And as Holly reminded everybody that tomorrow I will love uh, this recording, I will um, edit it a little bit and then upload it to our YouTube channel tomorrow. And then I'm going to send all of the people that signed up tonight reminders in case you'd like to watch it again. Or maybe some people missed out and didn't get a chance to tune in tonight. Well, thank you. And we would like you to tune in next week. Um, will be our finals um, spring gardening virtual session. It's going to be on growing lavender at 7 p.m. next Wednesday night. And thank you, Remy. We enjoyed tonight's talk. Yes, thank you. Good. Yay. good night, and everybody. Have a good night. Happy gardening. Bye, guys.